like to thank the National History Center and my fellow panelists, and thank you all for coming. <coughs> Ebola has focused our attention on West Africa, and for good reason. This is a palpable crisis, one with tremendous implications for people in the affected countries. It reminds us that the effects of illness far exceed the toll taken on individual patients. It exposes the fault lines in public health, both in West Africa and here at home. And as Professor Packard and Professor Mittman have explained, it underscores the perils of the historical evisceration of African healthcare. Huge sums of money have been spent. Armies have been deployed. But in the shadow of the spectacle of Ebola lies something much broader and much deeper a vast landscape of non-communicable disease that's rapidly emerging clear across Africa. This situation, by everyone's estimate, is only going to intensify in the years to come as processed foods, tobacco, and other known carcinogens find growing markets on the continent. This is an epidemic hiding in plain sight. If I asked you all in this room to name the pressing problems in African health, I am sure you all would have said Ebola, you probably would have said HIV and malaria. You might have mentioned drug-resistant tuberculosis or childhood diarrhea or hepatitis or maternal mortality if you were really on the ball, and you'd be right. But heart disease, diabetes, cancer, they probably wouldn't have occurred to you. Even though in 2010, the number of non-communicable disease-related deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa was well over 2 million, nearly double the number of AIDS-related deaths on the continent that same year. An estimated 12 million Africans had diabetes in 2010, and that number is expected to double by 2030. In Sub-Saharan Africa, these are not merely problems of the elderly. People tend to develop these diseases younger, and the disease progresses much more aggressively than in Europe or North America. These are often deaths of the middle-aged, people who lie at the economic and social center of the well-being of an entire family, workplace, or community. Nor is death the only thing that matters. The paralysis that comes from stroke the blindness and the gangrene that follow from diabetes, the horrible, relentless pain of cancer are a tremendous and costly ordeal for patients and for the communities of people who support them. So Africa faces a double burden of both infectious and non-communicable disease. These problems are related, they are rooted in and complicated by histories of poverty and the imposed privatization of services, and they are synergistic. Together they point to the urgency by which robust health systems must be built and maintained. If African hospitals and clinics can't cope with the infectious disease and obstetrics that they were designed for, then the situation is far worse for non-communicable diseases problems that African health systems were, for the most part, never intended to address. Many African countries have little or no funding for prevention and control of non-communicable disease, and this means they have little surveillance. Currently, an estimated 85% of diabetes on the continent goes undiagnosed due to lack of capacity. That turns a potentially manageable disease into a debilitating and deadly one. Nor is there screening for cancer, where, as we all know, early intervention is crucial. Even if diagnosed, most cancer patients have a hard time accessing care at all. For example, the International Atomic Energy Agency estimates that only 20% of cancer patients on the continent have any potential access to radiation therapy if they need it. Most people have to pay out of pocket for this treatment, which puts it well out of reach, even if a functioning machine is present in the country, to which a very sick person must travel, often hundreds of miles over difficult terrain. This is a terrible irony 
given that African mines account for a significant percentage of the world's uranium from which such therapies derive their power. And if there is no screening and no treatment, then problems remain invisible, and that only enables further exposure to disease-causing agents. To take only one example, we can think back to 1991 when Lawrence Summers, as then Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank, suggested the dumping of toxic waste in Africa. He argued this made sense because Africans don't get cancer. He was wrong. But his thinking seemed plausible at the time because of the failure of health systems to identify what was already a substantial and growing burden of cancer on the continent. When surveillance doesn't exist and problems are hidden, not only is prevention not undertaken, but vulnerability is increased. Maybe you're thinking, oncology, that is never going to work in Africa. Well, it can, and it must. It must because the human and economic costs of cancer, like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, are simply too high to be ignored. It must because Africans, like patients everywhere, are empiricists. They take note when clinics and hospitals fail them. When those institutions are places where people go to die, they avoid them. As we have seen with Ebola, with polio vaccination, and before that with HIV and with XDR-TB, if people don't trust in the efficacy, the safety, and the good intentions of the health system, they'll avoid it. And it must, because cancer, again like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, renders patients more susceptible to infectious diseases like tuberculosis. So untreated non-communicable disease becomes an amplifier for new in, um, epidemics of infectious disease. We've seen from our recent experience with Ebola, when we fail to acknowledge epidemics, they escalate. They become far more expensive, more intractable, and they threaten political and economic stability and growth. Professor Packard has described for you how the evisceration of African health systems came about. African oncology, too, had promising beginnings that were cut short. In the 1960s and 70s, important research on virus-associated cancers was done by East African oncologists to the benefit of us all. Meanwhile, meaningful oncology care had begun in some places in the early 1980s before privatization undermined entire health systems. But what has been allowed to decay can and must be rebuilt on new footing. Right now, African healthcare is configured mainly as an archipelago of disease-specific programs run by a range of different private, NGO, research, and government concerns. Patients, who again are very sick people, must swim between the islands of the archipelago, often up current, at great expense, and often against impossible odds. When African patients with cancer, or diabetes, or post-stroke paralysis tell researchers like me, I wish I just had AIDS, they're making a commentary on the shape of the archipelago, one to which we should listen. The fact of the matter is this. Epidemiology, or patterns of disease, is dynamic and it is not always predictable. Whether it is HIV or extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis or Ebola or cervical cancer, we cannot always anticipate what is coming next. Therefore, strong public health systems and not only vertical or disease-specific programs are necessary. These systems must include epidemiological capacity for public health surveillance and planning. Health planners need to be able to anticipate what's coming next to know where best to direct their resources. An epidemiological capacity is necessarily predicated on screening and diagnostic capacity. Screening and diagnosis, in turn, are necessary to identify pathologies early in the disease course when they're most um, amenable to successful intervention. And screening and diagnostic capacity 
in turn, are predicated on infrastructural capacity, from sanitation to functioning laboratories. And lastly, of course, these health systems will require care. Technologies alone, while necessary, are not sufficient. Non-communicable disease reveals the limits of any fantasy of technological quick fixes. If only there was a vaccination for heart disease. Instead, they point to the need to train and support the nurses who will help to promote health and manage long-term illness. Nursing is rarely at the top of the healthcare agenda, but it should be. Nurses are the backbone of any health system. They're the ones who best understand the communities in which they work. In short, in order for people to buy into health systems, to cooperate with, and to trust them, such systems will need to be broad-based and public, and they will need to consider people and not only their disease. Thank you.